Welcome back to my kitchen. Today I am going to be showing you my recipe for gluten-free graham crackers. So this recipe is one of the recipes I'm actually really most proud of because I love a good graham cracker. I grew up with them being my after-school snack and I could not find, still can't find a good gluten-free graham cracker in the store. There's some that are okay, but none of them really taste like graham crackers and really have the right texture. This recipe does that. The secret ingredient is flax seed. It's ground flax meal, just a very tiny bit. And I wanna talk about it for a minute because I often get people saying to me, I don't like flax, can I use something else? I will tell you, I personally don't love flax either. I don't use it a lot. I don't like the flavor of it. It does have that strong kind of flavor to some people. In this recipe, the small amount we use is actually what really helps make these taste like real graham crackers. So I suggest that you use it. If you have an allergy or something, you can't use flax, I will include in the recipe notes, the recipe is linked below, there will be notes for how to replace the flax because the flax serves two purposes. The main purpose really is for the flavor, but it also does help act as a binder. So if you're not using flax, you need to use egg or something else. So those notes are in the recipe. So to start off, again, as always, all of our ingredients are weighed, not measured. Again, with gluten-free baking, this is really important. Using a scale, learning how to use a scale, it is not difficult. And once you do, it's gonna greatly improve your gluten-free baking. It makes it faster, prevents mistakes, and overall your results will just be so much better. And when we're talking about expensive ingredients, you know, I find that the less we waste them, the happier everybody is, the better it is. You don't have to remake things. You don't want inconsistent results. You find a recipe and you love it. You want it the same every single time. And the way to achieve that is by using a scale. So let's get started. So to start off, I'm going to take my dry ingredients. So I have my one-to-one -one flour, and I'm gonna add that to my bowl my sugar, which in this case today I'm using maple sugar. You can use maple sugar, brown sugar, or raw coconut sugar, whatever you would like, whatever is best for your personal diet. To that, then I'm gonna add my salt, baking powder, baking soda, and my ground golden flax or golden flax meal. You can buy it pre-ground or if you just already have some flax, you can just use what you have. And I'm just gonna whisk this really well together. If you have any big clumps of sugar, if you're using brown sugar or maple sugar, you can get your hands in there and break them up. We don't want any clumps. And you wanna make sure, the reason this whisking part's important is we wanna make sure that our all of our ingredients are well mixed together. So baking powder, baking soda, we don't have any clumps. It's dispersed throughout. Same thing with our flax that everything is really well distributed. So I have a few little lumps in here of my sugar. So I'm just gonna get my hands in and really kind of break, make sure that I have them all broken up. That will happen sometimes with brown sugar, sometimes with uh, maple sugar. I love the flavor of maple sugar. If you need your um, things to be less refined, if you're looking for lower glycemic index, less of an impact on your blood sugar, both maple sugar and co raw coconut sugar are great subs for brown sugar and even granulated sugar and recipes because they really won't change the texture of your final result very much. And they are much lower in glycemic index and much less refined than regular sugar. So now that we have everything all mixed together here, we're gonna move on to the next step, which is our butter. So you're gonna take your butter and it can be cool room temperature <clears throat> is fine. I'm gonna put gloves on for this step again because I'm doing a video and I don't wanna have to wash my hands a whole bunch of times. You can just use your hands. If you would prefer to use a pastry cutter or two forks, you can do that as well. But I do find that your hands are the best for this job. And I'm just going to, you can see here, I'm squeezing it together to start breaking up my butter into these kind of big flaky pieces and coat it with the flour. And that's what the goal is here. Just like with making pie crust, we're working quickly. Gloves are good too, because they do help keep the heat from your hands from really melting the butter. And we're just trying to break the butter up until it's all like little, no, no piece is bigger than the size of a pea and they're all coated with flour. And what this is really gonna help us with is the texture of our crackers. We want them crisp, but not hard, and there's a difference. You want a crispy cracker that snaps when you break it, but you know, graham crackers aren't hard. They're crisp, and there is a difference. And the, the way we mix the butter in and also the leavening is what helps with that. If you're dairy-free, you can use a dairy-free butter. Whenever we're replacing regular butter in a recipe with dairy-free, um, you should be using stick butter. The stuff that comes in the tubs, unless you're using shortening, which you can use as well, which is solid at room temperature, but the vegan butters, margarines, that come in a tub are really too soft and that will affect your results. So you wanna use the one that comes in a stick. My favorite is Miyoko's if you can have nuts, it's cashew based, but I really think that is the best butter alternative and it is one of the only ones that comes unsalted. So now we have this, you can see, really well mixed together. We have no big lumps. 
kind of mealy. It looks and feels like sand. We're gonna move on to the last step, which is to take our honey and mix it into our cold water. It doesn't have to be ice, ice cold, but you want it not warm water, so take, get it as cold as you can get it out of your tap right before you start. And I'm gonna mix all of my honey in. A little tip when you're weighing honey, you could use maple syrup here too out into a container, spray your container with cooking spray first because it makes it much easier to get all that little bit of, that last little bit of honey out. So I have all my honey in there and I'm just gonna take my whisk and whisk my honey and water together really well. If I were to just try to add the honey by itself, do them separately, it's so thick, it would, we would never get it evenly distributed. This is just gonna make that so much easier. So now I'm just gonna take this and kind of evenly pour it over my dough. And again, now here you can use your hands or you can use a fork. So I'm going to start with a fork and just kind of, you can see here right into my bowl, just mixing it together. And it's a fairly soft and loose dough. This is going to also depend on how um, warm it is in your kitchen and how warm your butter was. So we're just gonna get this to come together into a dough. It's basically the texture of a, cook, of a cookie dough, like a chocolate chip cookie dough. And now we are going to put this onto a piece of plastic wrap or parchment. I prefer plastic wrap because we need to put this into the fridge or the freezer to set up for about a half hour before we roll it. So I'm just gonna take my plastic wrap here, put a nice big piece out onto my table. And then I'm gonna take my dough and turn it right out onto the plastic. And it will make it easier when you go to roll if you can get this into, we're making square crackers. So we're gonna to wanna to roll this into a square to have the least amount of waste. So if, if you have this roughly shaped into a square and get it fairly thin, like a half inch, it is going to make the rolling process easier when we take this out of the refrigerator. You won't have to work quite as hard. So you get it to about a half inch into a roughly a square or rectangle shape. And you can use the plastic to help you with that as well. So here I'm just gonna, I don't really have it centered on this. Do a better job than I did of centering it. And I'm just gonna fold this piece over. You can use the edge to help you. Pull it in, make sure it's all covered. And we're gonna pop this. I like to put it onto a sheet tray so that it stays nice and flat when it goes into the refrigerator or the freezer. So you can either put this into the refrigerator for a half hour or into the freezer for 15 or 20 minutes. Kind of depends a little bit on how fast, how cold your freezer is and how fast it freezes things. You don't wanna leave it in the freezer more than 15 minutes or you will have to take it out and let it sit again or put it in the fridge. You could put it in the freezer if you're gonna hold it, you know, you want to do up until this part and hold it to finish it on another day, that would be fine, but you would wanna pull it out and then let it come to refrigerator temperature before you try to roll it or it's gonna be really hard to roll. So I'm gonna pop these in the fridge for a half hour and then we'll come back and roll them out and cut our crackers. Okay, so I have my dough here that has been in the refrigerator for about a half an hour and we're gonna take this and start to roll it out. If it feels, if you start working with it and it still feels really soft and hard to work with, you can pop it back in for a little bit longer or if your kitchen's, you know, really hot. You can roll this, you can cut these any size you would like. I like to make them in three inch squares. I find that's a nice size for s'mores or just as a nice snacking cracker, but you can really make them any size you like. But think about that when you roll it out. I like to roll it in roughly, I measure it with a ruler, so it's roughly divisible by whatever I'm doing. So if I wanted to roll the whole thing out, and do three inch squares, I would do it 15 by 15. So then I would get five in each direction. Today, I'm gonna to show you how to do it rolling on a silpat, which isn't quite that big. I don't have a really large one. So I'm gonna do a smaller piece of dough. I'm gonna cut my dough in half and I'm gonna roll it on the silpat. The advantage to rolling it on the silpat is a little trick I'm gonna show you is that if you wanna keep your crackers really square, you can actually pop them back into the freezer before baking them and um, that way they don't lose their shape when you move them around. So you, because this still pot's a little more sturdy than if you were to roll it straight on the counter or onto a piece of parchment, you gotta move them, they change shape a little bit, kind of like with sugar cookies. But this way, if we have it on a sill pat, we can move the whole thing and not have them lose their shape at all. So it's already sticking a little, I should have put. <laughs> so it is still fairly sticky. I should have put a little more flour down before I put it on the board at all. So I'm gonna generously flour my board. Kind of like pie crust, we want enough flour so it's not gonna stick, but not much more than we need. You can always brush it off, but we don't want 
a lot of flour on the outside. And you're just gonna start to roll. You're gonna roll these really thin. So they're going to double. They're gonna puff up when they bake and double. So however thin you roll them, remember that the end result is gonna be twice that thickness. So I'm just gonna keep rolling. And what you can do is check with your ruler every once in a while. So I'm gonna shoot to do nine, which is divisible by three, by 12 or 15, which again, both divisible by three. So I'm just gonna keep rolling and kind of check every once in a while. The great thing about this dough is that you can re-roll it. So if you have scraps, you're not gonna mess anything up. When you trim the edges or if they stick or you have some sort of issue when you're rolling, it's not a big deal because you can re-roll this. It's not gonna affect anything. So it's starting to stick. I'm checking to make sure it's not sticking and I could feel it was getting a little sticky again. So I'm just gonna apply a little more flour underneath and I'm gonna go back to rolling. I'm gonna guess that's almost 12 inches. We're getting close. So I'm gonna go in the other direction to get my nine. You can see that one piece of dough, I'm rolling it quite thin. So it stretches more than you would think. And again, every once in a while, just check and make sure that you're not sticking to your sill pad or your parchment. And I'm gonna keep rolling, check our width here. Oh, I'm close. They go a little bit wider, so we really get nine all the way across, and then we'll trim it up. So now I'm a little more than nine that way, and I'm a little more than 12 that way. So I'm good, and that's, this is half my dough. And if I look at the thickness, that's pretty good. Maybe I want them just a little bit thinner, because again, remember, they're gonna double. So it's personal preference, and it takes a little bit of practice. The first time you do these, they may come out a little bit thicker than you want, and then you just adjust next time you make them. So now, you don't have to do this part. Again, you could make these any shape you want and you don't have to be, they don't have to be perfectly square. It's really up to you, but I'm just gonna trim my dough and I'm gonna take the excess away. We'll just save that because I can re-roll it. And now we'll measure to nine inches up here. I'm using a pizza wheel to cut. You could use a knife. I like a pizza wheel or a pastry wheel. If this is something you were gonna make a lot or you do a lot of pastry in general, they do make cutters called bicycle cutters that have three, four, five, seven wheels all attached that you can actually set the distance so they're all three inches apart and you just go like this once and it cuts everything for you. So that's a nice option if this is something, if you think you will be using cutting things fairly often, if you have a cottage bakery or something, those are great to have, they save some time. So now I have my nine inch, I'm just gonna go and get my 12 this way. Again, I'm just trimming to make it nice and square, it just makes it easier. And straight up, take my excess. It's a soft dough, but it's really workable. And again, if you just use the right amount of flour, just enough so it's not gonna stick, and not too much, you'll be perfect. So now I have my 12, so I can divide that. I'm just gonna go make a mark every three inches. And go ahead and cut those. So again, if you wanted to, you could buy a square cutter. You could cut these into little Teddy Grahams or goldfish or something for snacks. Again, I just like this three by three. I find a really good size for s'mores or these crackers actually would work to make an ice cream sandwich. You could use them and sandwich ice cream between them and then freeze them. So now I have my strips cut that way. I'm just gonna go the other way. And again, cut them into three three inch. That first one was slightly off. Now, if you want them to stay really square and you're worried about them because they're so thin and the dough's a little soft, you're worried about when you pick them up that you may lose shape, you can take this entire sill pat, pop it onto a sheet tray, take this entire sheet tray put it in your freezer for five or 10 minutes, they will freeze solid. Then you can easily pick them up and spread them out on your baking tray to pop them in the oven. That way they don't lose shape at all. The other option is to bake them close together like this, or I'm gonna show you what it looks like to transfer, just so you can see what it looks like to transfer them to a sheet without chilling them first. So if I was gonna transfer them, I like to use one of these. This is often called a fish turner, a fish spatula, because they're really flexible and thin. They're easy to get underneath, and you can quite easily pick up your cracker, and it doesn't lose, you know, it's not losing much shape. You just have to be careful. 
So either I just really wanted to show you both options so you kind of know that other little trick, especially if it's really warm. If you're doing this on a warm day, then popping them in the freezer could be a big help. And so you're just gonna space them apart a little bit. They're not gonna spread much. But you wanna give them a little bit of room. Get them all on our tray, and then we're gonna prick them with forks, which serves two purposes. Yes, it's decorative and makes them look like the graham crackers you're used to seeing in the store, but also pricking them with the fork helps them to bake evenly without puffing uh, in an odd way or an uneven way. So now I have all my graham crackers on that tray and I'm going to take another fork. So this recipe, if you're doing this size, the three inch squares, you're going to get 24, 25. If you really keep re-rolling all your scraps, you'll get 25, 26 graham crackers of this size. So you can see I'm just, and how, how many times you prick it with a fork is really up to you. I go three or four, two rows of three or four. And then these are gonna pop right into the oven and bake. They do not take very long to bake. We're just gonna bake them until they are golden brown. They take about 18 minutes or so. You want them to be golden brown all over. They're gonna feel slightly soft still, but they firm up as they cool and I will show you what that looks like. So these are ready to go. I'm gonna pop these in the oven. We'll come back and see what they look like when they're done baking. So I have my leftover scrap dough here. I'm gonna show you one more thing that you can do with this. With this dough, if you want to make a traditional graham cracker crumb crust for cheesecake or something like that, you can bake off the graham crackers the way we just made them and then grind them up the way you would with regular graham crackers. But if you know that's what you're gonna do with them, you can also just roll it out in big flax sheets. I would still roll it very thin and just bake it off in sheets or odd pieces like it doesn't they don't have to be perfectly measured or anything because you're going to uh just grind them up afterwards but the other thing you can do with this is take the graham cracker and make a graham cracker tart crust with this so you can take it and roll it out and i'm using a little cake pan to demonstrate but if you have like a fluted edge tart pan you can do that a big one a small one anything you like to do it in a cake pan you have a couple of options i'm still going to roll it thin but say I wanted to make a little fruit tart or like with graham cracker, it'd be delicious to do like a chocolate caramel tart inside of a graham cracker crust. You can use this to make the crust by rolling it out a little thicker than you would roll it for the actual graham crackers. I'm going to trace whatever side my, whatever size my pan is. So we're gonna trace this little pan. I'm gonna cut a circle out that then I can pop into the bottom of the pan. You could also just press it. If you're using a fluted tart pan, you could just roll the dough out and then press it right in and up the sides. Because I'm using a straight edged cake pan, I just cut my circle out. Then I'm gonna pop it in. I have a piece of parchment lining the bottom so that I will be able to get it out later. Pop it right into my cake pan. And then I'm gonna take this and roll a strip that I can roll around to be my edge. So I'm just gonna roll this into a long, thin strip. I want it about an inch, and that's, this is gonna form the side of my straight-edged. If you ever see the tarts that are very modern-looking, flat, straight-edged, this is how you want it. This is how you would do this in a pan. You can do this with tart dough or a dough like this, the graham cracker dough. So I'm just gonna roll it into a long strip. Because I don't have a lot, I'm using my scrap. I'm gonna keep working it. I don't want to have too much to waste to cut. I want to get this as the length that I need it to wrap all the way around the pan. So I'm just going to keep rolling. That looks like it's almost the right length. A little bit longer. I'd rather have it be too long. And you want to try to keep it even as even thickness as you can. Again, remember it is going to double in thickness. So I have this a little bit thicker. So this looks like it will almost reach all the way around my pan, but not quite. And if you had to piece it together, you could. And then I'm just gonna use my ruler to give myself a nice straight edge. And the way I rolled it, I can actually just use the thickness of the ruler. So here I have the dough you can see in the bottom of the pan. I'm gonna take this, you can flour it a little bit if you want to be sure for this part, just to roll it up. You can roll around something if you want to, just to get it into the pan. And then I'm gonna set it into my pan 
and roll it right around. So I'm a little short. But I just wanted to show you this. So this is using my scrap. If I wasn't using scrap, it'd be much easier. I could cut it out and get the right size piece. But I just wanted you to get to the idea of what you can do. So you would put this together. You'd want it to come all the way around. And then you would fill this with plastic or some parchment paper or foil and pie weights or beans. You would blind bake this, take them out, par uh, fully finished baking this so you had a pre-baked shell and then you could fill it with whatever you wanted to for a tart. So that's just another way to do it. Like I said, you can also just use the graham crackers, bake this however you want, grind them up and make a crust for your cheesecake that way. Okay, so the graham crackers are out of the oven and I just wanna show you that how long they take to bake is gonna a bit depend on how thick you roll them. So I rolled these nice and thin. This is a, a good graham cracker thickness. You can see here if I that they're still a little bit soft. So you can see that they still are flexible, but as soon as they cool, that's gonna be gone. This is the color you're going for, that nice light golden brown color. With this thickness right here that you're seeing, I can feel these starting to crisp up. These took just about 15 minutes. So I always set my timer for about nine minutes, then I check them, set it again for five, six minutes, and then check again. Towards the end, I'll check every few minutes. It takes a little bit of babysitting, but they can go anything thin like this, any type of cookie can go pretty quickly from being perfect to being a little overdone. So we'll just put them on this rack here to finish cooling and they will crisp up. If for some reason you're not sure, you pull them a little too soon, they don't crisp up quite as much as you would like, you can put them back into the oven to dry out a little bit more. Then you wanna store these in an airtight container. Once they're fully cooled, if you store them in an airtight container, they will last for quite a long time, up to a month. You can also freeze them if you would like to. But like regular graham crackers, they will last a very long time as long as they are stored in an airtight container. So I hope you enjoy this recipe. Make some s'mores. It's a great summertime recipe, but really any time of year, because again, you can use these for your cheesecakes or anything else you like. I always love them as a snack, just with milk when I was a kid. I hope you love them. I hope your kids love them. And I'll see you next time.